Okay. Something's not going. All right. Here we go. Uh, welcome again, everyone, to what is now, I think, the, the fourth of my own live webinar interviews with uh, various folks. And I am absolutely thrilled once again. I'm, it always seems like introduced by saying I'm thrilled because I am. I've been getting these great guests and, and I, I keep pinching myself. Like, mm, what did I deserve to do to deserve uh, having such great guests on? So today we're, we're in for a treat. We've got Dr. Matthew Levering and Dr. Matthew Minard, two Matthews. And we're going to be discussing today. Uh, resource month theology, neo-scholasticism, Thomism, what, what they have in common, what they don't have in common, whether various narratives surrounding them are false or true, and uh, what can we do to build bridges? Might we actually have common foes, common enemies that we ought to pay more attention to than sniping at each other, us resource month guys tossing Molotov cocktails at the neo-scholastic guys? and so on. So uh, first I'm going to begin, we're going to have our two, because I neglected to solicit bios from them, like the horrible interviewer that I am. We're going to have them introduce themselves, just like I did last time. <laughs> I don't learn my lesson. So we're going to begin with Dr. Matthew Minard. Could you please introduce yourself to the audience? Give us uh, your background and that kind of thing. <clears throat> uh, yeah, so Dr. Matthew Minard. I my primary hat, at least, is I'm a professor of moral theology and philosophy at the Byzantine Catholic Seminary in Latrobe, Pennsylvania. We uh, we take seminarians primarily from the uh, Ruthenian Church and the Melkite Catholic Church. So I wear a couple different hats there. Um, and then I also do work as a translator, which maybe some folks are aware of. Uh, some of that will come into the story of how I got into scholasticism and, and whatnot. Uh, but, you know, I've done work on, especially works of Reginald Garrigou Lagrange, a number of texts that hadn't been in English I've done of late, okay. um, and some other stuff too, so. Okay, well, that's that's very good. And now, Dr. Matthew Levering, who I've known, I've just recently met Dr. Matthew Minard, uh, you know, electronically via computers. Uh, but I've known Matt Levering now for a while, and it's always a pleasure to see you again, Matt, if you please introduce yourself. Yeah, my name is uh, Matt Levering, and I teach here at Mundelein Seminary in um, the Archdiocese of Chicago. And I'm I'm 50 years old, and I have I don't really have a specialty, but I I do um, I do books and research on on different aspects, and I'm I'm the co-editor of um, Nova Vetera. Well, you do write you've done more than write a few books, Matthew. You've, won, you've written quite a few, and. Uh... Uh, I, I think that's fantastic. And I, gosh, I didn't know you were 50 years old. I, just like when we first met, it seemed like yesterday we were both just young pups. But uh, mm -hmm. time marches, tempus fugit. All right. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to begin then once again with Dr. Minard. And uh, this this entire interview started with a uh, an email that Dr. Minard sent to me after having, I guess, read one of my blog posts or something where he said, hey, you know what? I, I like your blog. I like what you're writing. But... All right. We have to get to a central truth here, which is that uh, this this typology that is often used to describe the preconciliar church, where we break camps down into the neo-scholastics, the resource month, the progressives. And then we talk about how, OK, the resource months won in the council, progressives won after the council and the neo-scholastics were just sort of left out in the cold and good because they deserve to be left out in the cold because all they were were like two-tiered Thomists with their birthday cake anthropology with <laughs> super nature just sort of sprinkled on sprinkled like, on, like, like, you know, like sprinkles that. on ice cream, uh, which is, of course, a caricature of the neo-scholastic position. And mm -hmm. I am guilty as charged of pushing this stereotype in some ways. I try to nuance it here and there. But it's deeply embedded in my resource month DNA to, to see it that way. So, Dr. Minard, please tell me why I'm wrong, because I think I am, and, and, and enlighten our audience uh, as, as to what your, what your insights are into, into this problematic. Well, yeah, I'm not going to do the why you're wrong, because, you know, I said to my wife, I said, I may have in you, Larry, someone who's going to be a bigger personality than myself. And so I don't want to I don't want to take that. Up. <laughs> but I think like telling just the quick story of like how I even back myself into Thomism uh, kind of gets me then to how I I mean, I started out as very stridently pro neo-scholastic because I was so struck at how much I'd been lied to. 
So when I was, I was a seminarian for a couple of years as a Benedictine and, you know, sort of just like so many places, it was a kickback almost a generation earlier, very anti Thomist, even though it was the early, it was 2008, 2009, 2010. Um, and I read Jacques Maritain's Degrees of Knowledge and was just absolutely bowled away. I was blown over. I mean, my, my epistemology professor who assigned it, who was my dear novice master, a very, very holy man, but he was a phenomenologist by, phenomenologist by training. He said, I didn't assign that to you in the hopes that you were going to become a Thomist like this. Uh, and he got over it eventually, though. Um, but it was so counter narrative to what I had heard, which was, I mean, more, more of a progressive reading, even more than sort of your, your joking uh, narratives that you just presented. I mean, it really was as though there was, you know, there was really nothing of any currency whatsoever, currency even in the 1930s that could come out of scholasticism, let alone today. And of course, you read something right. like the degrees of knowledge, you end up with all the swath of everything Maritain was doing, especially in the philosophy of science and in mysticism mm -hmm. on the edges of, of epistemological questions. I was just taken away. And and so after I left the monastery, I kind of had the period of trying to find my identity. And I latched on to Maritain so much that in graduate school at the Catholic University of America, I became known as that Maritain guy, which that was my first taste, actually, of kind of the integralists hating because they, I was kind of an outsider because I was a Maritain guy. Because a lot yeah. of guys who were trained at, at Thomas Aquinas College didn't like him. But I, I was, when I was working on my dissertation on tedious 14th century logic stuff, my director was, shall we say, he was a very dear man and a brilliant man actually, but it was not good at emails. And so I'm waiting on email answers while I moved up here to the house in Pennsylvania because my, my then fiance lived up, lived up here and we live here now. And I was waiting for responses on my whole dissertation. So I was reading The Sense of Mystery by Reginald Garrigou Lagrange, who I started to appreciate a little bit more because of Maritain. You know, I knew that, you know, despite their falling out, they'd had affection. And The Sense of Mystery really actually, Sense de Mystère really blew me away that I saw all of a sudden that while it was still pretty scholastic, that you had a real like appreciation for the mystery involved in the supernaturality of faith um, I didn't encounter the sort of two-tiered anthropology in the way that it was stylized and presented to me. There was all kinds of stuff, too, from the tradition, the earlier scholastic tradition that I was seeing resonant even in a text like that, that I realized it wasn't neo-scholasticism in a kind of way that was this pastiche from the late 19th century. Like, there was something deeper here in the Thomas school that I started to see echoes of. Right. And foolishly, I decided to translate a book. Like, for my first ever French translation project, I did a whole book. And may Scott Hahn be blessed that he took a risk on me and they had very good editors to, you know, sort of help me through the process. And I did that and I just kept sort of digging down the hole with uh, Garagou, you know, and I just found, I found a lot of light and then a lot of repetition. <laughs> um, yeah. Right. But like, I realized that, you know, the narratives even I got about him, which some of that I got from the Maritan circle were, were, kind of o were overstated. Um, there was, a, there was a, just such a beauty to his uh, theological appreciation that I, I think actually planted seeds for even stuff like you saw in Chanu later on about theological methodology, which is so strange to hear. You don't, wouldn't think that. There's, of course, the spiritual theology stuff, which is in some ways even recognized as his most uh, independent thinking. Yeah, I, I agree um, with that. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, even where he was doing, quote unquote, manuals, he never did a manual. He did commentaries on the Summa, was kind of the most rigid format. And then De Revelazione, you know, which is kind of a tedious Roman text for teaching. And it has some of the superficiality that goes with it. But on, on point for point, topic for topic, it may miss many things. Because when you approach Revelation in that kind of extrinsic credibility way, kind of propositionally, there's so much of the mystery that is a Byzantine. I mean, I see it lacking. But I, I was just too struck by the power of the, to especially the Thomist school, um, that all of a sudden some of the stuff I got in grad school that, you know, my professor Monsignor Whipple, who was very much a historical Thomist guy from a... a oh, you studied, under, you studied under the famous Whipple. That's great. Yeah, he's just finishing. He's just retiring now. He's been, he's been a professor there over half oh. the length that... Of the existence of the faculty, <laughs> sixty yeah. some years or seventy some like seventy years or something. True. And, uh, so he's just retiring. God bless him. So like even that that anti Thomist school stuff, I started to to, to get 
like warning lights on. And, you know, so for instance, then I'll kind of be quiet just to use one neuralgic issue that comes up so much is like, you know, the supernatural issue. Even the critiques of, of Cajetan you find in someone like Garagu, right? There's this, sup, this supple reception of the later Thomists in him. And I, I just started to get the sense that, oh, okay, he himself is, is coming from, from a tradition that's far more free thinking than I realized. And then I encountered some of this in his students, jean Hervé Nicola, um, it was, you know, kind of went off in an in a even more open dialogue way when he taught at Freiburg, but then Michel Labradet and others. I just saw the Thomas School could give fruit that wasn't just throwback. And then I did work on the Nouvelle crisis and I've got a volume with Dr. John Kerwin that I have coming out with CUA Press. And that blew my stack a little bit. That's the real thing, Larry. Because I feel like the dialogue was missed because yeah. especially the, the Toulouse Dominicans and Fourvier Jesuits just ended up talking past each other. And it, it collapsed too quickly because of the Roman authorities swooping in. So. Yeah, there were a, the, the reasons for the collapse of, of the dialogue, I think, are multifocal and have a lot mm -hmm. of... In some ways, we can't ignore the roles that personality and historicity play uh, the history of persons in the sense that, I mean, a lot of these guys knew each other and, and actually didn't like each other. <laughs> uh, yeah. and, and, and that sometimes colors, colors their analysis uh, uh, quite a bit, but I don't want to, I, I also want to reiterate uh, or double down on your recommendation of Maritans, the degrees of knowledge. Uh, that was an absolutely seminal book in my own formation as well. Uh, in fact, I read it uh, before I, I started reading the Resource Monk guys. Uh, I wasn't introduced to Balthazar until my junior year of undergraduate studies, whereas I read Degrees of Knowledge when I was a sophomore. And I, I was, abs I, I, you know, it was like for, for a 20-year-old for a 20 -year -old reading that, it was like trying to get a sip of water out of a fire hose. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, I, yeah, I, I'm not going to sit here and posture that I was some sort of wunderkind able to <laughs> imbibe all of Maritan at age 20, but I I was impressed with it, let's say that, and it impelled me further. So I, I never really ever had a sense that, okay, these guys, but here's the deal, and I'm going to turn this over to Matt Levering. I never really thought of Maritan as a neo-scholastic, and I don't know why. Uh, I, I thought of him as a, as a kind of Thomist. And I, I think this is part of our problem, a problem of terminology. I know, like in Tracy Rowland's book, Catholic Theology, I think she identifies in there at some point about 17 different varieties of Thomism that at some point or another were floating around, you know, in, in the 20th century. Uh, you know, Ranarian Thomism, Resource Mont Thomism, Thomist Thomism, Neo Scholastic Thomism, you know, Whig Thomism, M M Mary Shalian Thomism, Ranarian Thomism, Transcendental Thomism. I mean, it's, you know, existential Thomism. And, and it just, and Maritan had his own version of Thomism. So, yeah, I guess in a lot of ways, I think a lot of us Resource Mont guys, when we toss a word around like Neo Scholastic, I think it's actually more of a totem or something. It's, it's more of a symbol for what we perceived as a problem with Thomas's epigons. A pr you know, everyone in their own school of thought tends to criticize another school of thought based on its weaker elements, <laughs> its weaker links and say, aha, see, that's what represents that group over there. Those nitwits and nincompoops on the fringes. And and yet we wouldn't want that same uh, same jaundiced eye turned our way uh, either. Uh, and, and therein lies a problem. So I, I'm, I'm going to turn it over. All that being said, I'm kind of rambling all over the place. Just immediate reactions to what you said. I'm going to turn it over to Matt Levering now. And, and Matt, you want to make some introductory remarks or respond to what <laughs> I just said or what Matthew just said? Go ahead. <laughs> Well, this is wonderful. Um, I'm so glad you're doing this, Larry, and and also, you. Um, you know, Matt, Matthew. I'm really honored to be here with you guys. Now, now, I, I, there's so much to talk about. Really, it's, it's you could have a, a million of these podcasts. I think. Yeah. The, um, I guess, I guess, I think the main thing is that, um, you know, we're we're entering a entering a period where. Um, Kind of ma maximal um, charity for our forebears, but also also it's a sense of the um, the continuity of the Catholic tradition. The the Church has really handed on the faith in in a in a in a way over each century. 
that um, means that that there's some fruit to be gained and and um, something to be learned and a faithful handing on um, by the theologians of of, of the, those eras. So so essentially, we're learning, I think, to um, you know to kind of uh, appreciate really the um, the work of Catholic theologians, um, say between uh, 1550 and, and 1950, as as they handed on the faith, but then also to retrieve for our own time uh, all sorts of things and and um, uh, all sorts of insights and 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 so on. And then and then we also know that there's going to be different theological schools. So there's going to be schools of thought and styles, and um, and these different styles are going to coexist uh, within the church so long as we're united by um, you know, moral and dogmatic uh, principles that we share. Right. So, so I think we're, we're entering a period where we're getting a deeper sense of the schools and reintegrating um, some centuries that that were sort of, um, at least in my own education, were, were really not not present. And I think that's very positive. And then I also think that, um, that nothing that I hope that, um, you know, we're learning and sharing with each other is just that we don't have to follow the principle all or nothing. Right. You know, oftentimes, the principle "all or nothing" is kind of thing because um, it's the question would be like if 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 there's if there's all this value to be found in in Charles Journet or Anscar Vanier or even Reginald Gargou Lagrange, then why should we have um, Andre de la Bach and von Bolzar and Ratzinger? But but here here we apply the principle of it's not all or nothing. You know, in other words, right, um, right. we can have we can have um, different people getting um, in different schools, and and we can we can criticize. I often point out the Balzar was was um, um, he had a gift of criticizing, um, but also taking um, insights. So he would criticize yeah. all sorts of people. Um, you know, all, even his favorite theologians, he would criticize them. Yeah, and then yeah. You know, he would also take insights, and and I think that um, that. Not all Bal not all followers of Balzar, for example, will want to do that. But but nonetheless, it yeah. it's still a possibility that we can share together as different schools of thought and and um, kind of um, work together so long as we as we're united by our basic um, moral and and dogmatic um, elements that we that we obtain from divine revelation from scripture and uh, tradition. I, uh, I, oh, I, I completely concur with that, and I also agree that we could spend hours and hours talking about all the issues that are involved here. Uh, a couple of things that you just said that I want to react to. First, the, the all or nothingism. I think that's key, Matt. I think you really nailed something important here. I see this in personally. It's anecdotal. I don't do any Pew Research studies. <laughs> I'm not out there doing sociological analysis. I base it on what I like, what I don't like, who I see, who I don't see. And what I see out there in the church is a rising tide of, of uh, both progressives who are being re-empowered in the church today in certain ways, yeah. and then the, the dialectical reaction against those progressives in the form of, a, of an increasingly radical cadre of traditionalists. And it seems mm -hmm. like the ecclesial political tail is wagging the doctrinal dog in a lot of ways, the theological dog, because mm -hmm. it seems like your ecclesial stance politically speaking, comes first, and then your ducks line up, and there is a purity test to be allowed. Uh, you know, so, you know, the progressives are going to say, you know, let's let's get rid of Ratzinger and his legacy, John Paul and his legacy. Let's just do a great reset back to Vatican II and, and the liberals there. And, and let, so it's scorched earth that way. And then you've got the radical traditionalists who say, you know, modernists, progressives, resource month guys, it's all the same. It's all the same. Let's just scrape the barnacles off the whole of the ship that's accrued to it over the past 50, 60 years. And let's just get back to Gary Goo and, and you know, and Thomas Aquinas. And so I think that scorched earth um, sort of all or nothing mentality has got to go because both sides, all sides have something to contribute. And the best theologians that are out there do, as you pointed out with Balthazar, do precisely that. Mm -hmm. I also think it's important, too. Uh, and this is uh, is sort of something you alluded to. Why do we need to make common cause? Why is it important to dip into all the wells of the church's treasury and resources? Because the church does face sort of foes. It does face enemies, both internal and external. And uh, those of us who are concerned with the ongoing handing on of the tradition of the church 
ought to, in a sense, appreciate each other more deeply, which is why I so appreciated Matthew Minard's original email to me. Mm -hmm. uh, to said, let's set aside some of these little spats that we have between what were variations of traditionalists, and, and let's try and focus on, on where the true enemy lies. But anyway, um, if any... I, I, Let's 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 get down to brass tacks here for a second with regard to one of the more nettlesome issues, and we've alluded to it in, in the caricature of the two-tiered anthropology, the the issue of nature and grace, and the relationship between nature and grace. This is one of the things that that's the engine that drives so many of these uh, disputes, and of course the caricature of the neo-scholastics is that in holding that we have a purely natural final end as well as a supernatural end that God gives to us via grace, uh, the, the resource Montclaim, of course, is that layers our anthropology and makes grace something extrinsic to us. Whereas then the neo-scholastics look at the resource Mont guys and say, you're all a bunch of intrinsicists. You're all quasi-gnostics. <laughs> you're all on the tail hardy and elevator towards a seamless, a seamless theosis. All right. And without any sort of ruptures along the way and that our human nature is just so open to grace and all that uh so those are the caricatures so what what let's go back to matthew minard what what do you think are is the is the nub of that de, of that debate and uh what do you think both sides have to say in that debate well i think the nub of the reason for the debate is ultimately two different philosophies talking past each other i think that a lot of the guys in the 20s and 30s and the among the french jesuits they kind of imbibed, I mean, they imbibed sort of a, a mixture of Thomism with Suarezian professors and some Blondel on the sly. And I mean, I'm not, that's not meant as negative either, right? I'm just, let's presume, you know, Gary Lagrange had a very nice back and forth with Blondel despite all the, the surface level fighting in, in journal articles, right? I mean, it was sort right. of style. Um, so you have, but you have like di different theories of judgment, different theories of, of uh, cognition, all kind of operative to begin with. So it's just kind of creating a, a brew in which you know, just two different philosophies will talk past each other, right? right. Um, which is, I mean, it's important to take into to account, especially the Blondelian piece, just because that's going to play a diff very different vocabulary in the background. Um, the Thomists are, are, you know, basically marked because their school, it could be the Thomist school. So I'm always kind of speaking within this line of, of the Dominicans is how I'm thinking. They were, they lived through the condemnations following on the, the Protestant Reformation, right? So the Bionism and Jansenism stuff. And so yeah. you yeah. have in the Salamanca Carmelites and uh, even, well, reflected even by John of St. Thomas and then in, in Gonet and Billuar and others, you know, a, a kind of precising of all that terminology, precisely out of a fear of falling into to, to collapsing the two orders into each other in a Jansenistic sort of way or in a, you know, in a way that's going to subsume nature into, into yeah. grace effectively. Now, I think a lot of second rate Thomists presented the two tier all the time, that there was, there was nature and a natural felicity, which somehow could be even maintained without grace, not even in abstraction as though God could have created without created human nature without grace, but really could have been, you know, could, you could have a natural felicity sort of on its own. I think there's a lot of that kind of stuff floating around. Now, I know that my quote unquote masters, Ambrose Garday, Garigou, Maritan, they had a profound sense of the way that nature itself would not be fulfilled if it did not achieve its nat supernatural end. But they still said nature qua nature would not be fulfilled if its obediential potency did not then get opened up from within to be supernaturalized. But there's a wonderful line in, in the true Christian life by Garday that I actually think is the best, the best in this line. And it's like two lines from notes that his nephew put together. Uh, and I'm not trying to hawk my books, but it is a really, really good book. So it's his book I'm hawking. And I don't even get money for the first 500 copies anyway. Um, the true Christian life is coming out from COA Press. and It's beautiful. Like it's a great text. And Father Garday says, he says, this is such a knife's edge to talk about the receptive subject of grace. Because on the one hand, you can slip off the knife's edge and and end up losing the gratuity of grace and its supernaturality. I mean, he doesn't quite, he talks right, more about the right, gratuity side. Right. But he said, you know, the other side is if you go to extrinsicist, you are not divinized. If nature's yeah, exactly. obediential potency is not what is actualized by grace, you're not going to be yourself divinized. 
You know, I do think certain people stand up and shout and they say that's a Suarezianism. That's an act of obediential potency, which probably also is in the background of some of those Jesuits. Like that's why they're talking past each other. They're thinking of obediential potency differently because of what they got right. as from, from when they were Suarez. learning. Yeah, whenever they were in their studio. But, uh, you know, what, when I read that in him, I, I went back to a chapter in De Revelazione, and I'll admit, in Garagu, he sort of sees this, the fittingness of revelation uh, from the perspective of nature, but it's not as pronounced. I mean, Ambrose Garday's spiritual theology just led him to really, in, in that book on the, the soul and mystical experience, to really outline the, the way that our obediential potency is what is divinized by the reception of grace. But that doesn't mean that nature has now been slurred. It still maintains all those right. distinctions. But it became, you know, in this regard, I, I'm not, okay, I'll, let me throw my Molotov cocktail and then hand it over to you to give it to Matthew. I feel that Henri de Lubac on this, let's set aside the books, like Surnatural, a couple of the articles where he and Garrigou went past each other. I think de Lubac misexegetes the texts and digs his heels in. And I think Garrigou was a bit of a, I would use a more colorful word negatively. He was a bit of a, posterior, if you will, because he basically oh, yeah. said, go read, he said, go read the 75 pages in De Revelazione I wrote on this. I think he should have actually argued it out much more clearly in the series of those articles. Well, and kind of, yeah, go and that, so anyway, so point being is that this, this sort of has been received as a problematic that got amped up on the division that I really, I've had discussions with Richard DeClue where he and I keep saying to each other in emails, we're saying the same thing. I said, okay, well, you know, it's, it's, yeah, yeah. I, I, I've been emailing Richard back and forth lately as well. And he's got a lot of, you know, for those who don't know, he, you know, he's a De Lubac scholar. Uh, it, it's interesting. It kind of underscores my point about how there are personalities involved here. I just don't think De Lubac and Gary who liked each other very much. Mm. Uh, very uh, different. Yeah, very different yeah, personalities. Yeah, and, and, well, and, and I'll concede up front, as, as someone who prefers the Lubacian interpretation of nature, I'm going to say a couple of things. I'm going to turn it over to Matt. I'm always a little bit frustrated by, by the focus on Thomas Aquinas in this. Not that I don't think Aquinas is important. I think he's very important. But I think Aquinas is ambiguous on the topic. I think what he says on the one hand, he, on, on, on nature and grace in terms of final ends, he takes away with another. And I think both sides have a right to, in a sense, point to elements of Aquinas and say, see there? Look at that quote. That that supports me. And see that? that. So to me, can, that's I why I, a, can I make a hermeneutical observation? Just I think it's so important here. Sure, go ahead. I think that, you see, this is, this is those Dominicans of that era, they're so used to just reading the school and that's it. Now, I'm not saying that's how you should only read Aquinas. I'm just noting it kind of as a historical yeah. point, you know? Because yeah, one I mean, thing, and then I'll be quiet because it's a real arrogant thing. Garrigou says at one point, angry in an article, he says, we've been doing this for 700 years. How dare you come and... How dare you come and reinterpret it? <laughs> how, how, I mean, yeah. I'm simplifying it. So, so go on. Uh, I understand. There's, yeah. there, there's turf. There's turf involved. Yeah. No doubt. So but, I'll be quiet now. I'm so sorry. I'm not trying to defend. Point, yeah. the, my point, I'm actually defending in some sense yeah. the common tentorial tradition from Cajetan, or Dennis the Carthusian, others. You're right. I'm, I'm defending them on the grounds that resource month thinkers would often point to a Cajetan and say, see, that's where everything got off off the rails. Mm -hmm. That's where the misinterpretation of Aquinas began. No, I think Cajetan was reading certain elements of Aquinas and reading them properly. But I just think De Lubac and others were reading, uh, Bellarmine reading other parts of Aquinas. So, well, wait a minute. What about these, these bits over here? And so I, I think that I was very happy to hear you focus your comments really on a discussion of the nature of obediential potency, our thirst for God. And I, you didn't immediately run off to Aquinas. You you actually started philosophizing mm -hmm. and theologizing. Because mm -hmm. to me, that's the central importance here. Not mm -hmm. what does Aquinas say, because Aquinas could have been wrong, whatever he said. Mm -hmm. The question is, what did Revelation teach? What does Revelation mm -hmm. teach? And in that sense, I think de Lubac, though sometimes a very sloppy scholar, I think. I, I think de Lubac, like, for example, sometimes de, I've done I've done this. I've looked up some of his quotes from like church fathers or Aquinas. And I, I'm, I'm thinking, wait a minute, that doesn't support, that doesn't support what you're saying, Henri de Lubac. It actually says the opposite. So I, I sometimes wonder whether de Lubac's scholarship is, is completely up to par. Nevertheless, I prefer de Lubac's theologizing. I think mm -hmm. de Lubac is a better theologian than he is a scholar. And I think therein lies, if you, if you understand that distinction, and I'm sure you do, uh, and therein lies why I love De Lubac and, and the Resource Mont School. 
because I think there's some very original theologizing going on there. Mm -hmm. And it was a, a reaction against, let's face it, there was some two-tiered Thomism going on in that era. And it may not have been the best and the brightest of the Thomists that were pushing that stuff, uh, but it, it was definitely there. But anyway, I have so many more things I could say, and I'm sure you do too, Matthew. Uh, but poor Matthew Levering is sitting here listening to us, and I, I want to absolutely give Matthew his due and his chance here. So what say ye, Dr. Levering? <laughs> Well, I, I think that there always will be, um, you know, controversies over over grace and 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 these type of questions. And and I do think, like when I when I talk to um, people who really follow the line of um, De La Bac and and by the way, there's an interesting article on Kajitan, the Thomist, recently. Um, and the guy takes essentially a, a De La Bacian position, really. But the, the the basic the basic point I think though is that really we dis we agree on the fundamentals though. The fundamentals are, you know, that that there is such a thing as um, created human nature, right? And that um, that it does have purposes, and and there there is such a thing as natural teleology. See, this is something that um, when I talk to Nick Healy at the JP two or or anybody really, you know, and we believe in natural teleology. We believe in in the um, church's teachings that are grounded in the moral the moral teachings, you know, we um, that are grounded on natural teleology. But but we also then are both all committed to grace and to the fact that um that our destiny and our happiness uh really is that that union with, with god that's what christ has promised that's what we were created for we were created um in in christ and and so on so I, again i think i think that what we're dealing with here is um is uh kind of a um, a situation that arose because of something a bit deeper and what was happening i think was that um Essentially, these these guys, you know, around the turn of the century and whatever, um, well, they were looking they're looking for a way to renew Catholicism, and they thought that there was too much um, Aristotelianism in theology, really. And so, what they were doing is um, they were they were pushing against. Um, I think, in part, they were pushing against Aristotle, and they were just, um, you know, and that's that's why you see a big challenge to the whole of. Um, it's not just to a particular debate, really. It's it's almost everything for the second millennium. And, and so um, I, I just think, I think we need to realize that they were attempting to open up room for other schools of theology, for schools of theology that are more, that are less um, scholastic and right. more, right. Um, more X or Y. And, and to me, this is fine. You know, the Catholic Church has, has always had different kinds of schools of theology, as just has had the, the Orthodox Church also, though. By the way, you find the same thing in Eastern Orthodoxy. They they're getting rid of their Aristotle in the early 20th century, their yes, Aristotelian um, absolutely. and and they end up replacing it with this or that. But eventually, they're gonna they also will come back to a certain scholasticism. <laughs> you know, in other words, you can't um, these these kinds of uh, ways of approaching our faith are complementary. Now there may be dis there may be disagreements and things that um, that where people are going to really divide on on points of truth. And I'm not trying to down. I'm not trying to downplay those. But what I am saying is, hey, let's let's look at this and let's. Um, we got to realize that there are debates that are fundamental about the nature of revelation, in terms of do we believe in revelation? Has revelation happened? Um, do we believe in Catholic dogma? Do we believe in in um, the conciliar tradition? Do we believe in the monuments of tradition? You know, do we believe in yeah. in the moral tradition? Do we believe in that Jesus really revealed something? Do we believe in the apostolic uh, witness? You see, these are fundamental, and, and this is really what the bottom line is right now. And and so this is what we this is what we really need to attend to. Oh, I I couldn't agree more. I think that's true. I think that um, I, I think a lot of the reaction against uh, the the neo scholastics from the resource month thinkers goes to something you, that you just put your finger on that I think is very important, which is it was it was a reaction against the hyper Aristotelianism that had sort of crept into the to the interpretation of Aquinas, but not only the interpretation, but the uh, the manner of the presentation. I know that Balthazar, for example, he had a great article called uh, the, the Fathers, the Scholastics und ourselves. And in, and in so far as he goes through each ecclesial era and it, it makes to your point matt and he says okay here's the strength of the church fathers and here's where they fell flat here's the strength of the scholastics and here's where they fell flat but then he turns the, his gaze you know 
at himself, essentially, and says, and here's the value of modern theology, and here's where it falls flat. But what's interesting, and so it goes to your point that Balthazar is making, and I think it's so true, and you see it actually in his method, where he's so seemingly eclectic and drawing from all of these differing sources. He could be both critical of a thinker and then also at the same time imbibe what was great, and that's what we need more of here. But Balthazar did say something about scholasticism that I think is important in this debate, which is that for all of the and it goes to the vacillation and dialectic you're talking about, Matt, about for a while Aristotle and then re reaction against Aristotle, then back to Aristotle, and it's this. Yeah. So the great step forward in scholasticism was precisely its, its format lent itself to greater precision, great terminological definitional precision, a greater parsing out logistically of ideas and conclusions. That's its strength. It also happens to be its weakness, because at the same time that that happens, it makes theology a bit dry, a bit arid, a bit less evangelical. And as someone who loves Aquinas as I do, I have to admit, when I was an undergraduate and in graduate school, I was reading the Summa, and I was thrilled by it in its own way for its precision, all that. But it also had a certain deadening of my soul in some ways. I'll just be autobiographical. And then I, I, would, I would pick up some of these other newer, more modern authors. And I thought, well, there's an evangelical vibrancy there, a freshness, a repristination of the gospel in here that I'm not seeing in the scholastics. And I think that's part of the dynamic that's going on here. But I agree with you. I think, I think we need both, quite frankly. I think we need both approaches. Uh, and but Matthew Minor, do you want to respond to what Matt said or what I said just now? Yeah, you say, well, I had stuff from what Matthew said, but there's something no, I want to jump ahead. on. No, no. Okay, well, no, ahead. but there's something you just said I think that I can jump on that's that I think quite important there, actually. So just to think about, like, scholastic methodology. I could, I feel like I can say, I get to say this one as as the Garagu guy. The great ill of of the, the method that comes out of scholasticism is the scientificization of theology, which right. is also an important thing. But in Matthew, we even know it's in the back of my mind because it's something I published in Nova et cetera. You know, the wisdom side of theology gets lost in the science. I mean, this was a huge part of the debates that led up to the Chanu and Charlier stuff in the 30s where they got condemned. And then the Nouvelle stuff was this disagreement about the nature of theological, what they're always calling theological science. And, and kind of how do you get beyond merely conclusion theology? It's as though you kind of have the deposit of faith here and you just march through all the kind of conclusions you can draw by adding Aristotelian reason and experience to the deposit of faith. And, um, you know, let's just use the, I just a lecture I did today for a philosophy class. I'm teaching for Holy Apostles, just an intro to Aquinas for master's level students. I went and I said, look at the, the structure here of the treatise on, treatise on man. This is so different than what we're doing in philosophy. But I said, let me talk about the theology for a second. Notice how the Summa is laid out where it starts with the whole treatise on the Trinity, because yes, to understand the mission of the Son, I have to ultimately ground that in the Trinitarian, in intertrinitarian mission of the Word, right? Like the, right. not the mission, but the the uh, generation of the Word. The the mission of the Son is an extension of the generation of the Fine. Christ revealed the Father, though, and like that turns the entire order of the phenomenology of the of faith upside down compared to how the Summa is laid out, right? Because it's correct from a, a kind of scientia perspective. The Trinity explains the incarnation, but Christ reveals to man the Father. And I sometimes want to hit my Thomas brethren up beside the head on this, that, you know, they think that I'm going to overturn the, the, the format of theological science by making a comment like that. I, I, I know exactly what you're saying. I guess that's my way of saying I concur with what you say, and I'm the guy who has done over a million words of Garrigou into print. And then one last <laughs> thing I'll put up. Pin in, and I'd be interested in hearing your guys' thought on this, because Matthew, you've come back over and over to, I think, something that's so pivotal here is the ascent of faith is not the ascent of theology. Mm -hmm. They're different. Mm -hmm. they're, 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 there's a, there is a kind of homogeneity because we are, we are in faith reflecting theologically on the mysteries of faith and their interconnection. But the ascent is different. This was so powerfully in the background whenever Father Labradet was writing in the Nouvelle Theologie controversy was, yeah. you know, this point that plural, and I even will go further. I'm like, pluralism is not only fine, it's necessary. As a, as a Byzantine Catholic, there is no way you can be a Garaguvian Thomist and have a, an ecclesiology I'm going to like. 
fun end of story, right? Yeah. But I could do this mm. across the board. I mean, I've got many brethren who just clearly have this. I mean, they live in a in all sorts of pluralistic holes of different different theological approaches. Some drawn from orthodox sources, some drawn from you know mixtures of just resource small things. Um, and that's fine precisely because the noetic character of theology is different. The, the knowledge structure of theology yeah, yeah. is different from the ascent of faith. I and if you just take that seriously, you don't lose your mind. You, you realize that like different souls are going to resonate with different theologies. I was a Benedictine, but other people were, you have other spiritualities, you know, that sort of thing. I sound like Chanu. I'm not trying to. But there's yeah. a kind of resonance there uh, that's that's different. So anyway, well, uh, yeah, no, I agree. I think you know, uh, you know, I think it helps to explain Balthazar's uh, strange comment uh, where he once wrote that you know, as as a young Jesuit uh, student, he was languishing in the desert of neo scholasticism, and it was killing his soul. And I, I think we need to remember, for example, someone like Balthazar actually was really looking into Germanistics and the eschatology of German <laughs> apocalyptic imagination. And I mean, Balthazar had this wide ranging, you know, it's, it's I often say, you know, Balthazar is good to, to sort of Rahner's Kant. And, and, you know, and this, Balthazar is this great majestic romantic poet type guy. And I think his whole soul wanted that path of the ascent. I think mm -hmm. it wanted the path towards wisdom, you know, and and I think he saw the value. I did. I do think he saw the value in neo scholasticism because it comes out in his writings. I mean, at the very least, he he does quote Thomas Aquinas more than any other author. So at the very least, he has a great appreciation for Aquinas. And yet here he is saying, scholasticism was really killing my soul. And I think you've just nailed it, Matt, Dr. Minard. That, that there's something about this distinction between ascent, wisdom, and theologizing in that regard, and theology as a kind of science. And you need both. And this is Matthew Levering's point. We need both of those things. <clears throat> and so I do want to go back to another thing Matthew Levering said, which is, okay, we can debate till the cows come home about natura pura, about whether or not we have, you know, in, a, in our state of nature, a, a, a final end that's purely natural. Would it be even, you know, but just because, you know, look at it this way. Aquinas says that even natural reason seeks after the causes of things. And eventually through natural reason, we can even seek after the first cause and know that there is a first cause. But ultimately says our natural reason is going to be frustrated because you can't know the essence of the first cause. And therefore, even on our natural beatitude, there's an imperfection. There is a frustration uh, and uh, that, that, that is not, in a sense, complete. And sometimes I think we think, oh, the, the, the neo-scholastics were talking about this very complete sort of natural happiness, and it's not true. My point is in this ramble is this. That in reality, in the single concrete situation in which we find ourselves, we find ourselves as created, fallen, and redeemed. And in that regime, our end is a supernatural end. And in that regime, we are called to the beatitude of theosis and union with God. Uh, there are important distinctions to be made. Yes. And that whole debate about nature and grace should go on. Yes. But I think Matt Levering is entirely right that we need to set that aside and say, hey, um, are we all called to beatific vision or not? Uh, yeah, we are. That's where we're headed. That's what we're doing. And, and maybe we ought to pay a little bit more attention to that. That's why I said earlier, Matthew Minard, why I think Gary Goo's greatest achievement is in his spiritual writings. Because I think that's where he gets most lyrical. That's where he gets most poetic. That's, that's Gary Goo spilling his soul out onto a page. And I found that the most thrilling parts of reading Gary Goulagrage, and I, and I still go back to it. I think it's just phenomenal. I think it's fantastic, um, despite some of its sort of dry neo-scholastic categories. He, he trans mm -hmm. Anyway, that, that's my point. We're, we're, we're called to Beatitude. So that then leads me to uh, we're already sort of uh, 50 minutes into this, but we could go for as long as we want, I guess. That leads me to another question I want to raise. And, of course, you guys can always go back and comment on whatever you want to comment on. Uh, I'm not the dictator of this room, uh, just the moderator of the conversation. I, let's focus on the fact that we all agree on something. The post-conciliar church wasn't so good. Things went wrong. Okay, there, there, There's some really bad, bad stuff that happened in the post-conciliar church. Now, 
the question is, my, my, my favorite word is multifocal. I think the causes of the post-conciliar degradations of the church, let's put it that way, are multifocal. But I think the central focus needs to be on the perfect storm of the cultural tsunami that swept over the church in the 60s and 70s and, and overwhelmed it. Now, there were precursors to that and all that. We could talk about all that. So my question would be to you two gentlemen, do you think that it is true, as some claim, that resource mont theology in slaying the neo-scholastic dragon created the post-conciliar turmoil? Or is the opposite true? Was the church, as Ratzinger pointed out in 1958, already pagan in his famous article, The New Paganism in the Church? All right. And was it already pagan because of neo-scholastic two-tiered whatever? You know, the caricature of it anyway, and had the rot already set in, which is why the House of Cards collapsed. So maybe the neo scholastics are to blame, the manuals are to blame. Are, are, who, are, who are we supposed to blame here, gentlemen? And what's the path forward? And I'm going to start with Matthew Minard here, and then we'll go to Matt Levering. Go ahead. Um, yeah, it's a great question. I, mean, I feel like it's, it's set up in a way that the answer is going to come itself. Um, I, I remember once Ralph McInerney in some interview made this point to some inter like pious interviewer kind of asking the same question. And he looked at him and said, do you really think that things were all that great in the church if this is what happened in, in the 60s, you know, prior to right, this? Right. And this pious interviewer just looked horrified because he was expecting a bit of like, you know, uh, complaining about whatever stock figures from from the 70s, you know? Yeah, right. Um, right. You know, although it's like, I, I feel like some of those polemics that unfolded at the council were unfortunate. Like that's one thing I do stick by is that it's unfortunate that the generations clashed and that kind of like set up some of the divisions thereafter. I mean, that being said, I think that it was, the, the church was beset from, it goes all the way back to the modernist crisis. It's all the, it, the church was really lacking identity on a number of things, number of fronts for decades and decades. Oh yeah. You have, and I'm not trying to do this is, I'm actually an ex Roman Catholic who became Ruthenian. I mean, I'm even canonically Ruthenian. So I am not doing the ex I'm ex Roman Catholic thing. But it's a it's a fact it's a sort of a fact point that I think works very well sociologically. You had low masses being said everywhere in in uh, Roman dia in Roman jurisdictions as a normal fare for people's liturgical involvement yeah. to the point that here in America, for instance, you know, whenever the liturgical movement was was happening, mostly in the Midwest, you know, the East Coast. I hate to be mean to the Irish, but the East Coast Irish bishops were poo pooing it as a bunch of that German stuff with those monks in the Midwest, right? That's just <laughs> one, and it is, that is a fact. I, know. I forget where that's I so read true. that. Oh, it's so true. That, that's such a, like, just indicative of the spiritual state of things, though. What the liturgical life does is kind of reflect what the state of things is. Well, that's just setting, I mean, that's setting the background for an entire worldly church. You know what, and then I'll be quiet after this, one more anecdote, but I think, you have to do this, right? You have to triangulate by way of anecdote and try to remember that everything's overdetermined, has multiple causes. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. If you've ever read the story of 68, the coup at Catholic U, as it was published by uh, Ignatius, the the picture of the American bishops that is that is uh, kind of presented there, which is not, it's not done in an overly polemical fashion, really, I don't think, is that when the current events unfolded, you had a bunch of bishops who were brick and mortar men. They knew how to That's build right. hospitals, and churches, which truth be told, were already starting to get ugly. Look at churches from the 50s and 60s. You yes. find this in the Ruthenian church. You've, I have a thing. I have a, a book here that an uncle of mine gave me. That's right here of a church's dedication in 1950-something. And I looked at the pictures and thought it was things were already on the way downhill. I wish I could. I wish I had flipped open to the right page. But anyway, well, these, these bishops were better at building schools and... Um, uh, hospitals and raising money than they were in um, at, at being concerned with matters of expositing the faith and mystagogy. There you go. There's a church from the 1950s. Oh, wow. Look so, at that. Hold that up. So, put, it yeah. up put it up again. I want to see. And I'll get again. the, I'll find the date, but it is, it is a, there is a, 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 you know, let's say traditional Latin mass being said in a church like yeah. that. Well, okay. Yeah. That's indicative of what's going on already. So like, I, I do want to say, take home your triumphalist narrative about 1965, not you, people who have this idea that it was this, you know, it was all the post-conciliar yeah. communio guys or whatever, and, and then look at that and tell me what was going on. So that's my that's my response. And now Gentile Matthew will come in with his 
Yes, okay. <laughs> Dr. Gentile Matthew Levery will, will, now, will now speak. No, no, I like what you guys are saying. You guys are saying great. It, it is. Um, I, I feel that I feel there's always, again, going back to the idea of like, it's um, the principle of all or nothing. You know, there's always problems to be addressed, um, you know, before the council, after council, you know, and so there's, there's some real problems, you know, with, um, with the, the period 1870 to 1950 or, or whatever, there's, there's all sorts of problems and there's problems um, today. You know, there's all sorts of difficulties. I, some of the problems that I would name from the period um, 18, 1870 to 1950 would be um, Catholic relation to the Jewish people. There was some very scandalous things um, that were going on, including a lot of um, pr um, promotion of the blood libel. Oh, yeah. Um, by yeah. by um, very serious things and then very scandalous. And then there were, I also think that the whole issue of... Um, Biblical biblical scholarship that was something that really needed to be addressed and attended to because you need a much thicker thicker account of um, of the, uh, the the biblical world a thicker account of of um, you know that that matrix um, so yeah and a thicker account of the biblical texts and and so on and a much stronger way of handling um, issues that arise from um, uh, historical critical work you need a stronger way of handling those things. And then um, ecumenism was another another thing because you don't know, because there was um, some built-in um, hatreds and triumphalism um, at, at points. But so look again, every period has problems. But but one thing I'm really trying to emphasize is that that we don't we don't want to fall into ecclesiastical fall narratives in, in right. some strong yes things. yes now, now thank we, you there, yeah there there are there are um, threats. You know, to me, to me, you would have an ecclesiastical fall if you um, renounced, if you renounced uh, dogma or the the moral teachings of our faith or something. You know, it's possible to have an ecclesiastical fall, but um, but I think I think really uh, it's fundamental to the Catholic understanding of of the Spirit's guidance that that really the faith has been handed on in the, in its holy teachings, holy sacraments, holy offices, and so so I I do think I do think that that the blame game just to get back to your earlier like who's to blame uh larry you, you raised that question for us you know the blame game is never healthy because obviously right. it's always exactly. always the answer is that somebody else is to blame and usually we haven't even read the guy that was to blame you know like i just to go back to my own um education um i i heard a lot about how terrible the neos classics were i don't know that i ever met a person my age who ever read a neos classic <laughs> i know <laughs> and by the way by the way, it would be very dangerous when in my era, you know, when I was trained as a doctoral student, it was very dangerous. You, you couldn't read the neo classic if you you could even to write a dissertation on Aquinas was considered tremendously retrograde. And and you would never um, Ratzinger. You could only read Ratzinger with a brown paper bag. You could not you could not quote Ratzinger. <laughs> oh, know, well, he was considered, uh, yeah, he was considered yeah. terribly reactionary. In other words, um, it was a different world. But the thing is, is that, that the kind of, um, you know, look, we back then we didn't read any neo classic and the whole phrase neo classic is of course tremendously misleading because um it, you know if you actually go back and read the theological conversations that are going on in the in the 1920s 30s and 40s you're going to find tremendous variety tremendous interest and a, a lot of very holy and wonderfully insightful people of all sorts of debates and and um and and disagreements and and all sorts of wonderful uh, scholars, once I once I went back and read, so I'm I'm very yeah. much worried. But just to sum up, I think um, I think yeah, we can identify problems with this and that. And there was a problem that the um, the ecclesiastical fall narrative had been pulled out, had been used um, to by by one generation to crush another generation, or to or to put it more nicely, to move away from scholastic um, scholastic yes. and Aristotelian. But I, I think I think look, the blame game has just got to come to an end now, and we. Yes. We really do need to just kind of let's let's um, turn down the rhetoric, read the other as much as we can, and and um, and really just remember what we have in common um, because we're in a new situation now that that is. I yeah, think we need we, to be constructive. Yeah, we, we're definitely facing uh, some common problems, and we need to to come together. I mean, it's so funny when you hear you talk about how when you're going through you you went to Boston College, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, let's name names. 
Let's let's do blaming. <laughs> let's do the blame the thing you said we don't want to do. All right. So no, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to say okay. We, we, I went to Fordham. That's where I got my doctor. You, you, <laughs> I guess, uh, you know, neoscholasticism was the, the name that should not be mentioned at, at BC. At, when I was at Fordham in the late 80s and early 90s getting my doctorate, it was Balthazar that was verboten mm -hmm. because he was being published and pushed by Joe Fessio, a Jesuit, Ignatius Press, all that. And he Balthazar opposed women's ordination and supported humane vitae and mandatory celibacy for priests and and, you know, uh, the Roman principle and the papacy and all that. So he was he, you talk about yeah retrograde reactionary, the idea that. So when I pr started proposing that I wanted to do a dissertation on Balthazar, I, I met with extreme resistance. And thank yeah, God for thank the God. Uh, late, great thank Jesuit uh, Edward Oaks. God bless you, Ed. We're, I'm, I'm sure you're in heaven. Uh, the, uh, there, I'll canonize Ed Oaks because I think he deserves it. Uh, you know, he came to my rescue. And, but that, so you're right. You know, in other words, ecclesiastical politics were driving the narrative. OK, so the, the assumption mm -hmm. the assumption is, Matt, if you're in favor of neo-scholastic thinking because you find some of it interesting and enlightening <laughs> and you just want to take it in and, you know, use it a little bit. Oh, then you're probably going to push a dangerous retrograde ecclesiology. And that's sort of yeah. the, the same with my pushing of Balthazar. I was like, oh, well, if you're a Balthazar supporter, then we, your ecclesiology is probably not ours. And so I think this is what drives so much of it. But then to go, up, okay, so to bring it together, things that we, that we have in common. First off, all these resource mont, resource mont guys from the middle part of the century that were in many ways critical of the neo-scholastics one of the things we need to remember is where did these guys get their training? Where did they learn what they learned? They learned it because the church had indeed passed on a patrimony to them. And it may be was not, not completely taught in their seminary formation or whatever, and they had to be autodidacts and pick it up on their own, but it was there to be picked up. Likewise, uh, we have to avoid, I think, a strong periodization. Uh, you go back to the 19th century, for example, and you find a neo-scholastic like Matthias Shaban. If you if you read Shaban, he's I, I think Shaban could be like a bridge figure. Mm -hmm. He's already anticipating those nature and grace debates. Now he comes down more on the side of you know uh, you know the the, the neo-scholastic narrative of you know a natural end and a supernatural end, both of them final in their own way. But then he goes, he gets all into the whole nuptial mystery of the beatific vision and how this in a sense is our common i mean when when you start he starts talking about how even what we're, we're adopted we're not adopted in into the trinity via christ we in a sense share the same sonship rights that christ shares in the trinity this is how deep our unity is going to be with the divine nature according to shaven Mm. And and here he is already anticipating all of this in the 19th century, uh, and you know I, I I like to say that this is a discovery all my own, but it was one of the last things that Ed Oaks uh, imparted to me. Actually, uh, Matt, it was at that conference at Mundelein where where I attended, and you know Ed was already in the process of dying, mm -hmm. where you know the conference in his honor. But over lunch one day, he said to me, you know, Larry, and I'm writing this book on nature and grace which sadly I have to say I haven't read. I have to pay homage to my former guy and, and read his final book. But he turned me on to Shaban. He goes, you need to read Shaban. So I started to read Shaban. And I'm telling you what, that just, but it only goes to make your point, Matt, is in my opinion, I mean, here's Shaban, a neo-scholastic, but he is this lost gem sitting there in the middle of the supposedly retrograde 19th century. And, and waiting to explode, in my opinion, if people would simply pick up. Anyway, I'm rambling. Uh, let's turn it back over to Matthew Minor to, for any thoughts you might have on what Matthew just said, what I just said. Yeah, I don't know. I'm pointing down because Matthew's at least at the bottom of my screen. You know, I, I think I'm correct in saying this. We should appreciate the fact that Matthew Levering has been deeply involved in making sure that it, uh, Emmaus Academic is working on those translations yes. of Shaban. <laughs> Um, so I just oh, want to make I sure did, we... I did not. Oh, I didn't even know that. Here I've stumbled under. I've stumbled this, onto this by bringing. This is this up. is this is one of these many important things Matthew Levering just quietly does mm. there, just smiling at us from his living room. You know, um, Matt. I didn't know, Matt. That's fantastic. That is great. Anyway, yeah, there. Yeah, because there's the Trinity volumes just coming out here 
you know, relatively soon. Uh, and yeah, Michael Miller has been just slaving away at that for uh, Emmaus Academic. But there's there's a lot that even, you know, there was one of the comments on the most recent uh, endorsements for the volumes that I think really uh, backs what you're saying. Because, you know, Shaven is in another way picking up on all that, like, late Renaissance, post-Renaissance stuff in people like Denis Peto or Petavius and others, yeah. where there is a real sensitivity for the resource mall that's already centuries before the 20th century resource mall. You know, he's writing in the middle of where, where then also Menia uh, comes out, right? So you just have that, it's all in the air. And so a mixture of the scholastic and the resource mall is really beginning in this, you know, the, this immensely erudite soul that is uh, uh, Sheban. I mean, yeah, he's a Garrett who loves citing Sheevan, even where he, dis he disagrees, like, you know, here and there. I mean, it's, you know, Sheevan yeah, clearly yeah. he loved. Um, you know, just two things I'll say is, you know, when you, whenever you end up with these blame narratives, you know, there's a logic to these sorts of things, right? It's kind of like, mm -hmm. I'm going to, now I'm going to get myself killed online, but it's like the traditionalists <laughs> who will back themselves into an earlier and earlier redaction of the yes. Roman form, right? 1955 is the, the current thing, but it's going to eventually be, you know, we're going to be back to like Gregory the Great reforms, you know? And I, I've got mm -hmm. opinions about what happened under Pius X with the Roman breviary, et cetera, too, it, you know, but luckily I can always say as a Byzantine, it's sort of not my issue. But there's a logic to it, right? That you, you start with a kind of purist logic and it's just going to keep pushing you down these paths. Well, poor Father Fessio, if you're an overly anxious scholastic defender against communio people are you going to say that the entire project that father fascio lifted on his back at ignatius press was a bad thing for the church in america i would want to say as someone who who basically benefited from the tail end of that so i barely had to know the bad years that you guys did i want to say to people like that how dare you that is a sin against filial piety to 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 do that and i think that that's the logic of this kind of looking for I people agree. to blame I, and i and I'm not a I'm not a Balthazarian, I'm not a Dilubakian, but how much have I benefited? That's a, this whole corner is that. The scholastic stuff's over there. Gosh, that just that that rankles me. I don't know if you ever read, and I, I've got kind of opinions about Rusty Reno after the after some stuff during the COVID period, but there was an article he wrote about um it was when um oh who gosh, the Dominican in, in England. He wrote the book um Aiden was, Nichols? No, 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 no. Um Starts with an F. Oh my gosh! Doesn't Fergus matter. Carr. Ferg Fergus Kerr. Fergus Kerr. Fergus Kerr. Yeah, yeah. He wrote it was some text. He wrote there was a review that that Reno wrote. I think back in like 2007 or something about you know the great the kind of the great generation and how the guys of the yeah, yeah. the resource month period had been formed by that. I mean, at, at once with the ecclesial tradition and the scholasticism that then when it was lost, you kind of, you lost the training that they had that enabled them to be what they were. I think it's a good essay, at least for like understanding sort of like the, the discontinuities after the council. Um, it is a good essay. And I like, I like Rusty. I mean, I have serious issues with some other things, but uh, Rusty's a smart guy. And, uh, you know, I've known him for quite a while. Uh, one of the things I, I when I, I remember when I first read that essay, I was infuriated by it because because his, his, <laughs> okay. his well, well, I was because his his point really. I mean, uh, I, I like to say is a lot of these guys have post Anglican stress syndrome pass. I call it, and it's, it's so many of these converts from Anglicanism and stuff come into the church looking for that sure port, and when they don't mm -hmm. find the sure port, mm -hmm. then they lash out and say, "Let's find that port because yeah. that's why I converted." I yeah. didn't convert mm -hmm. so I could find Anglicanism all over again. And trust me, I attend an Anglican ordinary at parish, so I know the I know the, the problematic. Mm -hmm. So the, the deal is this, though. At first, it infuriated me because he's saying, "Okay, they killed the neo-scholastic dragon, and they replaced it with something that you that's largely about wisdom, and you can't teach it, and it's not you can't pass it on." And so a whole subculture was destroyed, and a whole generation of priests emerged that don't even know the basics of the catechism anymore. And and that's our problem. So he said, resource Mont guys were great, but they're a sort of one off deal and they can't be repeated and they can't be taught. And we need to go back to the neo scholastics. I mean, that's why. I, but in, in another sense, as I got old and perhaps more senile, I said to myself, <laughs> Rusty actually is under something here. I don't think his fundamental point is true. I still think it's wrong. But. 
What it points to is that resourcement is not, it's not a noun, it's a verb. Okay, it's an ongoing project mm -hmm. that is not yet complete. And if we isolate it, I think it's in some sense as Rusty does, as this historically conditioned phenomena, largely in between the two wars, mm -hmm. uh, you know, now, well, not in between the two wars and then slightly after the war, uh, and their time has come and gone, the greatest generation, he called them. I, I, I think that's wrong, but I think he's also pointing to the fact that where are their replacements? Where is this? Because after all, resource month simply means let's use the medievals, let's use also the patristics, let's use the newest and best scripture scholarship, and let's and it's Matt and the point Matt Levering's been making over and over and over again here. Let's just get together and theologize from the church's rich treasury, all of the church's rich treasury. I take that to be the essence of resource month, and it's a shame in a sense that it's simply come to be associated with guys who are now long dead. You know, Congar, De Lubac, Chenu, all these guys. And, well, that was a nice run while they had it, but it's over. Uh, and I, I don't think it is over. And maybe it is. So, can I mean, I'm, you know, and it's, it's, it's funny. You know, I read that I read that article with this much less polemical view. I read it as. No, well, I have to go back and read it. I, so, I'm, a, I'm a jerk. So oh, no, I, I, I got my own. I got my own. I got my different jerkness. Don't worry. Okay. But I, 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 um. I guess like this is the received text is what we're looking at. The received text, how I took it was you could say it's like this is a good project, but it's only possible within an within an ecclesiastical culture that doesn't have a kind of breakage with its its debates, whatever they may be. You know, Matthew and I have done work, both of us in kind of different veins on conscience. And if you read the stuff on conscience from the 19th century, 18th century, it's dry, desiccating stuff. But it's part of the long conversation. And so you have to find a way to both, yeah. you know, tie in the conversation so you have the continuity of theologizing, you know, but you can then within it, I mean, within it, the renewal actually comes from going down as deep as you can into the actual sources of theological speculation, which are supernatural in the end. And so, you you know, you, you kind of need the the continuity of culture to do the resource monting if we want to make it a total that, yeah, that was, anglicized verb. You know, that was a big point he was making, and therefore, because that uh, that culture has broken down, you can't you can't do any more resource monting. And uh, but he made a further point, and, and it's you're right, he does. Here. You're right. You are. I do remember that at the end, though. And there he is a kind say, of we need he, to go back to those for teaching seminaries. Yeah, and, so I do remember. Yeah, that, yeah because, yeah, because be we need to retrieve that culture, and the way to do it is to go back and teach that same stuff to seminarians. Because quite frankly, you can't teach the resource mod guys. Yeah, and that's just and, the problem. And, that just and, makes and, you lazy as a professor. But no, but but what you just <laughs> added, though, I think is a terribly important caveat because it was also. And like I said, I like Rusty, and I don't want to be unfair to him, uh, because that is a huge part of what he was also saying, that, you know, it's kind of what I said earlier when I pointed out that the Resource Month guys learned what they learned in that culture, in that time. And so mm -hmm. maybe it wasn't quite so horrible and arid and desiccated as, as we sometimes make it out to be. But, you know, with regard to that arid desiccation, too, to in some ways defend the neo-scholastics, and I studied them, and I found them arid and desiccated. But the point is this. I also remember, you know, I, was, I read all of Balthazar's trilogy during my dissertation, putting a bullet in your head, reading it, because Ed Oaks demanded I read it all in German. And so, you know, it's rather turgid. And my German skills, let's just say, are rather pedestrian. But anyway, uh, so I'm reading Theodrama 1. Now, anybody, you know, the, you've got the aesthetics, the dramatics, the theologic, these three massive elements of the trilogy. Volume 1 of the Theodrama is this, deeply, densely philosophical analysis of, in a sense, the phenomenology of theater and its implications for dramatiques in theology. And nothing drier can be found. <laughs> you know? I, I've, I've found that to be just about as deadly as anything I've ever read in my life. In fact, I know, I'm not going to name names, uh, but a, a certain Balthazar scholar who once confessed to me that he started reading Theodrama 1 and just stopped because he just found it too dull and too boring. Uh, so, you know what? Sometimes th this charge of dull and desiccated is uh, in the eyes of the beholder, you know, and, and, and sometimes you have to do dull things in order to parse things properly. Uh, that being said, I mean, sometimes it can be an overdone. Anyway, mm -hmm. we, have, we have now gone uh, an hour and 15 minutes. Maybe we should think about making some 
final observations. There's nothing that says we can't do this again to do a follow up <laughs> to, you know, we can do some follow up emails and decide, well, maybe we should have discussed this, that and any failure in this conversation today is entirely mine. Uh, <laughs> but because uh, I am, after all, the moderator of, of this meet the press. What? So let's start. Let's I'm going to give the last word to Matthew Levering just <laughs> out of, you know, he's, uh, and uh, he, he's my older friend. So we're going to start with <laughs> Matthew uh, Minard to sort of get, just give us any random closing thought you want to give. Yeah. I, am I allowed to just be a, just the teeniest bit saucy in, oh, in my oh, wording? Oh, oh, oh okay. yeah, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, no, this is, I mean, I think pretty brief, you know, it's like with all this stuff, cause it's all related to it's the, the edges of this are the debates that are going on right now in the church is that, you know, it would be much more edifying to, to have real theological interaction instead of the journalistic bitching about what's going on in the church that, you know, what may make you more money up front, but is much less edifying for trying to actually meditate on the nature or the, on the, on the mysteries themselves and to actually do real theology instead of a kind of, you know, yellow journalism about whatever's going on with Rome. And, you know, there are real there's real suffering that's going on for certain people because of changes as regards like the, the Latin mass in the Roman church, et cetera. But a lot less bitching and just, you know, a lot more, you know, I think actually engagement in theology itself would be just so much more edifying, even if it weren't, you know, as fulfilling at the first minute. That's just more of a that's totally separate from the question of the scholastics and all that. that yeah, no, I that agree. really is, I, I think. You know, if you're going to do that, if you want to have an interaction like this, it, you have to set aside that kind of, you know, that 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 sort of journalizing. So well, you know, it's, I, well, I agree. That's my and my end. I will be quiet. You know, that's interesting. Before I get to Matt Levering, it's uh, you know one of the reasons why I started my blog, and it might be ironic because you would think blogging as a genre is inherently <laughs> oriented towards that journalistic bent that you just described and there is a superficiality to blogging because you have limitations but one of the chief complaints that some of my critics always point towards me is that my blogs are too long five thousand mm -hmm. six six thousand word blogs who can read that <laughs> it's because what i'm doing is theologizing just a bit no it's it's not on a profound scholarly level because it's a blog but that's kind of i wanted to occupy a certain space Mm -hmm. And to because you go out into the Catholic blogosphere right now, and it is, it is this blame game, as as uh, Matt Levering says, and it is this journalistic thing, as you say, and all focused on ecclesiastical politics. And so, you know, I, I think it's important for those of us who are trying to occupy social media to an extent to flip the script on that narrative and not be afraid to do some real theologizing. Uh, in the midst of your sort of online ruminations. Anyway, that's my blog post for my blog. But anyway, I, 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 so I'll just say that in my, my defense. But anyway, Matt Levering, uh, final thoughts, final words, sir? Okay. Well, well I, think, um, I think that there are a number of people um, doing, um, you know, interesting theology and 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 often from very different um, starting points. And so you would have... Um, you would have people from a Thomist or or even even from the commentatorial tradition um, working, and and they'll they'll be arguing against um, people. Um, so you might you might think of like um, my dear friend Father Thomas Joseph White, or um, oh yeah. yeah, you might think also of um, uh, uh, young young Dave Schindler, D oh, DC yeah. Schindler. And so there there I think there's some very fine the um, theologians and and scholars and many fine philosophers. Now I do think that these arguments are going to be intense, and and they, um, there's a certain intensity to the argument as, you know, people debate: um, do we need to move in a more scholastic direction? Do we need to retrieve? Um, I, I have some Franciscan uh, students here at Mundelein in my STL classes who are attempting to retrieve the Bonaventurian Scotistic. They're they're um, they're Franciscans, and they're very brilliant people, and they're going to argue also that this is what needs to be retrieved. My, my point is that there's plenty of intense debates, um, and when people have intense debates, um, it can, you know, the fur can fly. And and also there's a question of like what what do men need to receive in seminary? Maybe maybe they need to receive, um, you know, something more scholastic. Maybe they need to receive this or that. There, these are going to be intense debates. But but my point is that um, that all may be. But I, I may be the most political of all the people here, even though I'm I'm a theologian that I don't really write about. Um, I try. But my, my point is that this, 
is this, this is really kind of my final point, is that I think the situation we're in right now is essentially a, a, post, a post 1960s cultural situation where um, the whole, the whole um, understanding of divine revelation is sort of at stake. And, and I, I feel like that's essentially the point that we're at. And then in, in such a situation, I think we could take a page from um, a politician, even though I myself um, am no politician, no, I'm not a leader. Um, the, the politician is Ronald Reagan. And he, um, in a period of um, profound cultural malaise and questioning about the future, uh, he, he sort of articulated this vision. And whether or not one agrees with his vision, and I have areas where I don't agree with his vision at all, I think he enunciated a, a particular thing. He said, he said, look, let's not form a circular firing squad. For those of us who agree that the way forward is not, um, you know, kind of like uh, 1960s radicalism of a certain kind, he argued, let's not form a circular firing squad for those of us who agree with each other, basically. To me, that's the situation that we're in theologically, is that right now is the time to um, come together to defend divine revelation. We can still have a bunch of arguments on all sorts of theological topics, arguments that I engage in regularly, but there are some positions that um, that result in the um, the eroding of divine revelation. That it it and that those positions I think are clear, and it's clear to my mind that um, that all both sides here, the um, which you might call the racial small or the so-called neo-scholastic, you know these these people, their representatives, Father Fessio, D.C. Schindler, Thomas Joseph White, Nick Healy, you know, um, oh, yeah. and, and many are good representatives. Mike, these Han are not Mike Hanby, yeah, yeah, great guys. Mike Hanby, yeah, and and so on. These these are we we can come together and we can defend divine revelation together. While we could also continue arguments about should we move in a more Thomas, should we move in a more scholastic, should we do this or that or the next thing. Anyway, that's kind of my final thing. <laughs> yeah, my final thing is I agree with that completely because uh, I actually had uh, Father Embele on here on this show a few like last week and we were talking about day Ver day Verboom really is uh at vatican II so important i agree with you matt my whole dissertation was on balthazar's theology of revelation uh and mm -hmm. and the, the, the issue of the degradation of, of revelation uh in in the post-conciliar church in terms of our theological uh, re retrieval of that concept is the problematic i think beyond nature and grace and all that i, I think yeah. it's i think it's one of the cheap but i like the thing about you know let's let's avoid the circular firing squad in fact it's why when matthew minor you know first mm -hmm. emailed me and i have to admit matthew I, I i knew of i had heard your name but i didn't really know what you were about and that first email you sent to me where you say hey look here's here's the deal and laid out some defensive neo-scholastic thought i thought yeah this is and i thought immediately of you matt levering because I thought this is what Matt Levering is talking about all this. That's what he's on about, as the English would say. That's what Matt's on about. And I thought I have to get Matthew Mitered on 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 a on an interview with uh, with Matt with Matt Levering because I couldn't agree more. We need you know we need we we have to come together. Those of us who care about this church and care about this faith. So maybe we could do a future uh, sort of video down the road. I know we're all busy, so down the road where we could talk about concretely what can we do to make that happen other than little efforts like this one to bring voices together um do we have to wait for leadership from the top do we have to wait for an initiative from the pope uh or is this something that will bubble up from the grassroots if that's so how do we facilitate it how do we enable it and uh i think those are interesting questions for a future a future video you know this man this man down here can answer that for you too because oh, he does he a lot he's involved everywhere i don't know how he does it he must he has immense energy well and speaking <laughs> of which I, 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 no, <laughs> but the thing is i did not know for example that you were working on uh, translations and so forth of sheban uh and i think that's I think that's magnificent. How could I not know that we're doing that? Because Matthew Minard is correct. You're doing everything these days. Uh, <laughs> I wish I had your energy uh, and indefatigability and all that sort of thing. I, I, I'm lazy. I, my chief <laughs> vice is laziness. Uh, you know, and I, I'll start to write a book and say, maybe I'll just do an article instead. <laughs> it's like, yeah, books are for sissies. Uh, so, uh, so my hat's off to you too. Yes, Matt Levering, 
Yeah, <laughs> the, 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 down here, down here, Matt Levering. And, but also, to you, Matthew Minard, you're a really smart guy, and I'm glad to make your acquaintance, and I hope this is not the end of our conversation, but just the beginning. Uh, so, gentlemen, Sorry. thank you very much, and uh, I thank my, uh, stop my, thank my uh, viewers as well. Goodbye. Yeah.